Good morning. Welcome to worship at Ocean View Presbyterian Church. Our announcements can be found in the bulletin, which is available on our website. But we would like to bring a few to your attention. Christian education will be continuing today with the Lenten study based on the book, Meeting God in Paul, Reflecting on the Seasons of Lent. Today's lesson will be taught by Marie Whaler and will begin at 10.30 following worship. Please join us for this meaningful study. Zoom information is found in the bulletin and on our website. Please check the bulletin for items needed for the sharing pantry. Items can be dropped off at the church during office hours. Thank you so much for your continued support. Even though we are not able to meet together, the expenses of the church still need to be met. We once again want to express how grateful the church is for the support and generosity of this congregation. Please keep all of those on our prayer list close to your heart and in your prayers. And if you need someone to talk to or pray with, please contact Pastor Terry, a deacon, a member of the session, or one of our Stephen ministers. The minute for mission for March highlights one great hour of sharing. One great hour of sharing is received during the Lenten season. The monies received help improve the lives of people around the world who are in challenging situations. There are millions of people globally that lack access to sustainable food sources, clean water, sanitation, education, and opportunity. There are three main programs supported by one great hour of sharing. One is the Presbyterian Disaster Assistance. This program is the Emergency and Refugee Program. It allows us to witness the healing love of Christ through caring for communities adversely affected by crisis and catastrophic events. 2020 has proven to be a challenging year to be able to respond in person to these disasters. Because of COVID-19, some responses are done virtually and others, when possible, have local community volunteers that travel to the work site and return home daily. This is all in an effort to reduce the spread of infection. In the first half of 2020, more than half of the grants, grant monies went to COVID-19 response. The total was $2.5 million. The Presbyterian Hunger Program works to alleviate hunger and eliminate the root causes. In 2019, 94 grants totaling over $1 million were awarded. And third, there is the self-development of people. This program works with low-income communities, nationally and internationally, to overcome oppression and injustice. The projects focus on advocacy, youth-led initiatives, skill development, farming, workers' rights, immigration and refugee issues, and capacity building. All of these programs work in different ways to serve individuals and communities in need, from initial, initial disaster response to ongoing community development, their work fits together to provide people with safety, sustenance, and hope. Our gifts are directly supporting people experiencing hunger, homelessness, thirst, imprisonment, sickness, and deprivation, as well as welcoming the stranger. One great hour of shearing is the single largest way that Presbyterians come together every year to work for a better world. Please mail or bring your gift to the church office and write one great hour of sharing on the memo line. Good morning, friends. I am here only for a moment to share some news with you from your session. Uh, after months of discernment, 
going all the way back to some CE sessions back in last fall, and also reaching a peak during our leadership conference on January 23rd, the session has looked closely at the Matthew 25 initiative of the Presbyterian Church USA. And the session has decided to become, here at OVPC, a Matthew 25 church. That makes us one of nine in Newcastle Presbytery, which is itself a Matthew 25 presbytery. In taking this on, we chose the first of the three priorities named in the program, uh, eliminating systemic poverty, as the one in which we've done the most research and work and therefore a logical place for us to start understanding ourselves in terms of the three priorities of Matthew 25, the others being dismantling structural racism and congregational vitality. You'll see an announcement in the newsletter when it comes out tomorrow, and there will also be a letter to follow with more detail and a greater invitation. I want to stress the invitation. Please join us as committee members and as congregants in discerning who we are and who we can be in this wonderful place in the world we find ourselves. Thank you. Let us prepare to worship God. O oh Christ, the master carpenter, who at last through wood and nails purchased our whole salvation, wield well your tools in the workshop of your world, so that we who come rough-hewn to your workbench may be fastened to a truer beauty by your hand. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship. The Lord invite us, invites us to follow him. Lord, we take up our cross. Help us to follow you, O Lord. The Lord invites us to grow in relationship with him. We are his disciples. Help us, Lord, to grow in faith. The Lord invites us to answer his question, Who do you say I am? We say, You are the one who meets us where we are, the Lord our God. And we have come to worship you. Amen. Lord, have mercy on our efforts our attempts at love and faith, so that we may follow you and meet you in the silence. In this time of separation and even of isolation, self-denial is hard to discern from all we have been denied. Steadfastness, hard to discern from distance. Courage, hard to descend from absence. Give us hearts both pure and humble to truly see and hear you, we pray. Lord, give us hearts of love and of faith that we may live toward you, even live with you. We do not know you, yet we know we are yours. We do not understand you, but we know our life is tied up in yours. Meet us in the silence. Friends, God does not go back on promises. God does not reject us. God redeems us. Thanks be to God. Let us listen to the prayer of illumination. I pray, living God, 
Help us to hear your holy word with open hearts so that we may truly understand and understanding that we may believe and believing that we may follow in all faithfulness and obedience, seeking your glory and honor in all that we do. Amen. The scripture reading today from the Old Testament is Genesis 17. It is the story of Abraham and Sarah when Abraham was very old and with Sarah who was without a child. Before this, remember, their names were Abram and Sarai. These scriptures reveal this sign of the covenant. Listen to what God says to Abraham. Verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your ancestors after you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sarai. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. The Gospel reading this morning is from the book of Mark, chapter 8, verses 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it. And those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me 
and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. The word of the Lord. I realized this morning, looking at the beginning of the sermon, that I needed to make a very brief explanation. Um, in Greek and in Latin, the word apology doesn't mean exactly what it means in modern English. Uh, the word apology means something a lot more like explanation or rationale. So that John Henry Newman's apologia per Vida Sua means an explanation about his life or the reason he lived the way he did and not saying he's sorry. That should help. In his Apology, Plato quotes Socrates as having said, Ho anexatastos bios, u biatos anthropon. The unexamined life is not human living, or as we know it better, the unexamined life is not worth living. He said this while refusing to renounce teachings the Athenian Agora, the collection of philosophers, had found harmful or confusing to youth. Then Socrates famously accepted the cup of hemlock. He was sentenced to drink and therefore die. He did that rather than give up the right of free inquiry wherever it might lead. But by Jesus' time, a few hundred years later, the major Greek philosophical schools, the Stoics and the Epicureans, had settled into a far tamer frame of reference, characterized as oi daemonia, the absence of the demons of life, the absence of the problems of life. The happy life, was one as untroubled as possible by all the bad things that happened to people. Natural disasters and man-made disasters, accidents and illness, marital and political strife. This demanded equal measures of withdrawal from daily life, of unconcern about daily life, and very often of just plain grinning and bearing it. Not particularly aspirational, just safe and comfortable, and maybe a bit selfish. These attitudes had strong parallels in the Hebrew wisdom tradition, where having a good name, not going astray, and knowing your place were very high values indeed. Ecclesiastes expressed it well in chapter 2 in verses 24 to 26. There is nothing better for people than to eat, drink, and enjoy their work. I have seen that even this is from God's hand. For who can eat and who can enjoy life apart from God? For to the one who is pleasing in God's sight, God gives wisdom, knowledge, and joy. But to the sinner, God gives the task of gathering and accumulating in order to give to the one who is pleasing in God's sight. And by the way, Jesus was probably thinking of this when he told the story of the man in his barns. This too is futile and a pursuit of the wind. Please note, friends, that this is about two kinds of wealth we contrast to this very day, spiritual wealth and material wealth. And in both cases, standing back and not making waves and being scrupulous about things as they have always been, that is to say, being inside the tradition, these things are key to the good life. Why am I saying all this? For some perspective on today's gospel. Jesus very specifically points to God's plans plans which don't make obvious sense inside the Hebrew tradition of wisdom, 
In fact, plans that look impossible. Plans that don't intuitively link up to how things really work in this real world. And Jesus says that he, like Abraham, intends to be faithful and walk in the way that God has instructed. He will carry through the unreasonable impossibility because it is the will of God. And that's when Peter pushes back. And Peter's pushback is really if we will take a minute off from all the certainties that we have gained from knowing the end of the story, Peter's pushback is faithful. It's faithful to Jesus the person. It's faithful to Jesus the Messiah. And it's faithful to the mission of the Messiah because the Messiah has to live to reinstall the Davidic dynasty and for Israel, therefore, to become a light to the nations. Peter's pushback has a lot in common with the other side of Abraham, the side that laughed when God said Sarah would have a son in their old age, and then took out insurance along with Sarah by taking Hagar, Sarah's slave maiden, and sleeping with her and having a child, Ishmael, just in case this God who hasn't come through for over 25 years so far doesn't come through. This is the Abraham who lied twice about being married to Sarah to save his own skin. He claimed she was his sister, and he and she stayed separately in two separate kingdoms, she with the harem of the kings there. This side of Abraham didn't make waves because everybody knows that waves sink boats. If we're going to be honest, death and failure don't have a whole lot of appeal. And Peter, of course, sees both of those things as last resorts, not as ideas to get real comfortable with. Death in service to an ideal may be noble in the minds of true believers then and now. But the death of your inspirational, charismatic, and irreplaceable leader, just as the movement is getting started, that doesn't look particularly wise. So Peter got up his courage, of which he had plenty, and he faced off with his leader. Looking backward, we can see that Jesus understood more and better than Peter did or could understand. And that Jesus' sacrifice did accomplish, is accomplishing, and does accomplish for all time the goal of our redemption, which is the will of God. Jesus' sacrifice has been ennobled both in our theological and philosophical thought after the events, and also in the thought world of bold and adventurous seeking. Think of El Cid, not just the movie, but the fictional tradition behind the very real person who was nothing like the one we think about. Going into battle one last time, propped up on his horse because he was mostly dead and in fact died. Wow. Think of the Germanic vision of Christ as an heroic person, a strong person who who basically climbs up on the cross, accepting it as a test of strength. But then again, remember that all of this and all our theologizing are in hindsight. Peter, in this moment we read about, was looking forward into the unknown. Fear of the unknown, whether it's a panicked fear or a calm and reasoned fear, can still leave us paralyzed at the worst or frantic for plan B at the best. And Peter was a plan B guy, perhaps thinking, Look at him. Look at us. No one's like him. If it's all up to us, this thing is going to fall apart. Of course, Peter didn't have a strong and forward view of the work of the Spirit in Christian life, even though in that case he could have had more ground in intuition to work on because the Spirit is very much present in the Hebrew Bible. The early Christian legacy of mining the Psalms and Isaiah and Daniel by the Gospel writers, by Paul, 
and by Peter himself, all that was still 20 years in the future. You are setting your mind on human things, Jesus tells Peter. He is living out those philosophical thought systems I started with. What's comfortable, what's unchallenging, just the way it is, AKA the real world. In the real world, not everybody can have food or water or housing or education or life-giving employment because there's just not enough. But Jesus, who is God, knows that simply isn't true. That actually that stance is equal parts of selfishness and laziness. Whenever Jesus talks about giving all we have, those with privilege and possessions are the most confused because they don't know what he's talking about. It's not money, it's not furniture, it's not clothing, it's not bonds or houses or fields. All that we have, all that is actually ours to claim and maintain and be strong and be faithful with is our soul, which is made in the image of God. Peter didn't own a lot, but that he owned. We can think all we want, but the really big takeaway here today is that Peter evaluated all he knew and all he believed and waited against the man standing in front of him. And he got in line. We know he won't be perfect, nor will the others. Think of the sons of thunder asking to sit at Jesus' right and left hand in power. Or, to be a little more honest, actually asking their mother to ask for them. But conquering even part of our fear, part of our accustomed reluctance, means that we can conquer because God is on our side. So there Peter stood. Was it the power of Christ? Was it the power of hope? Was it the power of a very human drive made by God, implanted by God, to become fully all that being human means? In the final analysis, it doesn't matter. Peter got in line, and we are invited to join that line behind him. Thanks be to God in Christ. Amen. Will you please stand as you are able and join me in our affirmation of faith? Christ Jesus, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness. And being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every other name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess to the glory of God, Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. Please be seated. And we will come to our time of concerns and joys. And first, I will lift up a joy as we and the folks in Frankfurt and everybody who knows him celebrate the 90th birthday of Joe Schaefer. Other prayers, please pray for Peggy Schaefer and for her family in the far too sudden loss of JR to ALS. Please pray for Trent Collins about to undergo a liver transplant, his second, at only age 50. Pray for success and for all who know and love him. And please also hold Elsie and all the youngs and their families in prayer as the reality of life without George takes hold. Let us turn to God in prayer. Faithful God, we have been alone so long. 
sometimes we think we are forgetting how to relate and how to love, how to live out your purpose in our lives, how to be the us we know we can be but so often step back from being. Help us in this time to give to each other, even as we feel we haven't much to give. To love each other, even as we feel where is love. To serve each other, even in ways that are new, that are unaccustomed, that are awkward, that take longer and seem harder. Help us adjust to our new reality that is so much like the reality of people in many centuries past. Isolation punctuated by times of celebration together. Isolation punctuated by work, by prayer, by the knowledge of you as we look up at the stars. Help us to understand ourselves as just as human as all the people that we can know and read about and admire who have lived the life you urge. Help us to desire that. Help us to desire you. Help us in that desiring to be real presences in this world that is full of contrary and often violent and cruel desirings. Help us to bring the message of love where love is not, the message of mercy where mercy is not, and the message of patience where patience is not. Help us to be for you and therefore to work for you, to serve for you, and to love for you. And at the end of all that, give us our reward. Show us that we were doing your will. We ask these difficult things in the name of the man who overcame difficulty for us, the man and your son, Jesus Christ, who taught us his more perfect prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, God has entrusted all the riches of love to us. May we share the beauty and bounty of God with all whom we encounter. I will call for the offering. All things come from you, O God. We thank you. In these gifts, we return a part of your generosity in thanksgiving. Receive them, we pray. Receive us, we pray. And use both these gifts and us for your purposes in this your world. In Jesus' name we pray. As one heart is lifted, may we share its celebration. As one heart is burdened, may we share the pain it knows. And may we always and everywhere share the love of God.
And now, friends, I entrust you to God and to the message of God's grace, a message that is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance with all who are sanctified. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with you and remain with you this day and every day. Amen. <laughs>